Hey, welcome to an Image of God Chapel where fellow violins share a snapshot of their stories. You know, we do this as a way to begin discussion, to create awareness about the diversity of experiences in our student body. These testimonies are a way to celebrate the uniqueness of our experiences and for us to remember the God who has brought us together as the Biola family. You know, this week was Founders Week and we celebrated Biola's 109th birthday. That's right, that's right, 109 years old. And you know, so today we decided that we wanted to invite three young alumni to share their stories with us. But before I introduce them, I wanna take us on a quick tour of Biola's rich history, focusing on one of our founders, Lyman Stewart. That name might not mean a whole lot to us. Maybe if you live in the Stewart dorm, you kind of have an idea of who Stewart might be. But you know, he was a founder of Union Oil, which are like the 76 gas stations that you might pump your gas, your car at, okay? You know, he lived around the, 20, around the turn of the 20th century, and in his day, he was facing similar issues that we face. Consumerism, immigration, secularism. You know, in those times, in that time, he used his strengths and his gifts to serve God and people for the sake of the gospel, and that is our call even today. So we have the privilege of hearing from three alumni who are continuing Lyman Stewart's legacy. Each one is using his or her gifts to make an impact for the world, impact on the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll introduce each one of them as I tell you three qualities that Lyman Stewart was known for. The first quality Lyman Stewart was open to opportunities and he persevered, or you could say that he had faith and he lived it out. Our first speaker today is gonna to be Cindy Ortiz. She's a 2001 alumni who earned her bachelor's in journalism. While she was still young in her career, like Lyman Stewart, she has sought out opportunities and persevered in her career path. The second quality of Lyman Stewart was that he valued others he uses resources to help and empower others. Our second speaker today is gonna to be Brendan Anthony, a 2015 alumni who uses his gifts to resource and empower others. He earned a bachelor's degree in environmental science and is currently working on a master's degree in horticulture to further his work in his nonprofit, Harvest Craft. The third quality of Lyman Stewart was that he realized that using his skills to make money served a greater purpose. And so our third speaker is gonna be Alan Datcher, a 2001 alumnus who graduated from Biola with a BA in communication studies. He thought he knew what he wanted for his future when he graduated, but experience caused him to reevaluate his purpose. So with that, would you help me introduce, or would you help me welcome our first speaker, Cindy Ortiz? Awesome. Well, just coming back to Biola, so many memories. It's awesome and what a big blessing. Thanks for having me. So um, a lot of times as a college student, we start to create big expectations for yourselves, right? You guys agree? Um, well, let me get into them. One of them, ring by spring, hello somebody. Uh, number two, landing the dream job right after graduation. Number three, paying off those student loans right after you graduate, right? Real quick. Well, let me tell you something. I started off working uh, in retail. Yes, that was my first job, the mall. Uh, and now I didn't get my ring by spring. And yes, I'm still paying off those student loans. What can I do? <laughs> So um, I started off working out in retail. I wrote for a local newspaper for free. I also started editing a book on the side just to make ends meet. And then I got a paid internship at a TV network called Univision. And shortly after that, I started my digital media career at a YouTube multi-channel network called Style Hall. And I got hired at a tech startup after that called FameBit. And they actually recently got acquired by Google. And you know what? It took me about four years to get to where I'm at today and a place where I can finally call my own craft and my own passion. And that's okay. 
And I'm gonna bring up that huge cliche that we all have heard about, God's perfect timing. But let me tell you, it really was all about God's perfect timing. And about that ring by spring, the Lord blessed me with my man of God years later. He's actually right here and I'm actually gonna be marrying him in October. So praise to that. <laughs> And you know what, I look back now and I realize that it really was about God's perfect timing and not letting those big expectations get in the way of my journey. In our journey, however, we sometimes put limits on God. In Job 11, verses seven to nine, one of Job's friends, Zophar, tells him, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven, what can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Now that's deep. When I think about that scripture, I just start thinking about how big God is and how big his power is and how he has no limits. His love has no bounds. And we need to be reminded of that in our journey, especially as college students, because this is the time when the Lord is preparing you for your future. During my freshman year at Biola, I remember I became very fascinated about all of the missionary trips, especially one in particular, which was to Zambia, Africa. And I started praying and asking God, is this your will? I really want to go but I never heard back from the Lord, and I was like, okay, I am confused. I don't know, but I really want to go. So I remember after chapel one day, I came down from the steps. I used to sit up there, uh, and I came up to Todd Pickett, and I asked him for prayer. I told him the situation, and I remember he said these words, and I still remember to this day. He said, sometimes we just need to take a leap of faith in the unknown and go for it and God will be there with you in that. So I did just that. I applied to the Zambia missions trip. I got interviewed by their team, and I ended up going to Zambia. And you know what? It was one of the most incredible and memorable experiences of my life. And you know what? Sometimes we need to stop waiting for something and just make it happen, which leads me to Joshua 1.9. Joshua journeys the children of Israel and let them know to move into the promised land. While he's doing that, God says to Joshua, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, and do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua was not afraid. He went along in his journey and the Lord was with him. And sometimes during our time in college, we start to overanalyze, overthink, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my time at Biola? What is God's will for my time after Biola? And I look back and I think that if I did not take that leap of faith, the Lord would have blessed me with other opportunities. But that was my faith tester. When I came back from the trip, it was so easy for me to get involved at Biola. I started to write for the Chimes, the Biola yearbook. I also wrote for the Biola magazine. I became a peer academic advisor. I studied journalism in DC for a semester, volunteered in Tijuana ministry, led a missions trip to Honduras with the Honduras Water Project, and much more. And that's what really pushed me, that leap of faith. Being in the tech industry, there have been occasions where I've prayed for my colleagues and I've been able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Recently, I had an opportunity to minister to a few very successful people in my journey. And um, it's been one of the most powerful conversations I've ever had in my life. And I believe the Lord's gonna be doing something great in their lives. And you know what, even though I'm not in full-time ministry, the Lord still has been using me in very strategic ways. These um, conversations that have been coming up, the Lord has been um, strategically putting that together so I can be a light to the world. And for those of you who are being called to careers outside of full-time ministry, don't be discouraged, the Lord will still use you. You might be asking yourself, how will I make an impact for the Lord Jesus Christ if I'm not in full-time ministry? 
But let me tell you, God has called certain people to be at certain places at a certain time. It's not a question about whether or not you will be used by the Lord after college. He'll still use you. So, Viola, don't be afraid and wait for something to happen. Take that leap of faith and don't let those big expectations get in the way of your journey. All you have to do is take a leap of faith. God bless you. How you doing, guys? Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is Brendan Anthony, and I graduated from Iowa just uh, a couple years ago, so not too long ago I was sitting here in your position. Uh, I've been uh, working on a master's degree up at uh, Washington State University over the past couple years as well, and I would definitely recommend grad school for anyone that's uh, graduating and not really sure what they want to do next. Grad school definitely helps you buy a little bit of time, so if you're thinking about it, great opportunity. Here to talk to you guys a little bit about Harvest Craft, though, which is a nonprofit I started uh, alongside of my best friend, Craig Erickson, who actually graduated from Biola last year as well. And uh, we started it about in 2013. So actually when we were both still students here, and, and really what it came out of was us just wanting to combine passions for the world and for people, and, and this idea of we wanted to do missions. You know, we, we cared about social justice issues, but we also cared about the environment, and we were both really passionate about agriculture. And so we wanted to find a way to unify these passions and create a, a vehicle to do that. And so Harvestcraft has become a nonprofit to equip, educate, and empower communities worldwide and around the globe through sustainable food production systems. And what this looks like is that by creating one integrated you know, food production system like a chicken farm or, or a fish farm, we can start to tackle an array of issues. And some of those are, are there listed for you. And I'll just kind of go through them briefly, visually, so you can see. So this is at a pig farm down in Haiti, and uh, we actually just had 25 uh, new baby piglets born. But really what the beautiful thing about these food production systems is that now we can equip these communities in these underprivileged areas with a source of protein. With uh, a culture and a population that lives so much on just rice and beans, now we can you know, provide protein. I know it's a little bit malevolent to talk about cute little piglets as bacon, but that's the reality, right? And so it's a, <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Uh, but the other really awesome thing about it is that we work with communities and uh, we get to train people and equip them with skills. And then when they're successful, then we can equip them with jobs. And this is at a chicken farm in Haiti as well where we can employ nine people. And it's been an amazing thing. And what really uh, is happening here is that we're not just going in and giving them a handout. We're providing them an opportunity to, to generate income on their own, to, to empower themselves and to dignify themselves, and to be able to go out and, and alleviate debt, send their kids to school. And so that's been a real big cornerstone for us at Harvestcraft. Then we also work with orphanages, and orphanages are super, super expensive to run, right? You have their clothes, their food, their nannies, you know, all these different things. And so if we can equip them with a food production system, they can sell the food, they can get that revenue, offset costs, and then also be able to, again, feed the kids there. And with the kids on site, we can then give them education about the environment, about agriculture, about how to you know, run spreadsheets, all these different things, and, and set them up to live a life where then they can go out and get a job. Because at 18, they're age out of the orphanage, and they have to go fend for themselves. And this piece of vocational training has been super vital at our latest project, which has been in Cambodia. And what we're doing in Cambodia is that we've partnered with these other organizations at a sex trafficking rehabilitation center where one organization goes out and actually rescues the girls and brings them back to the site. And then another organization does the therapy for the girls. And then what we've been brought on to do is offer the sustainability piece. And again, so working with this holistic mindset, we can provide food for the girls there. We can provide uh, a source of revenue by selling them, uh, by selling the food. And then we can also you know, just make the environment super beautiful, right? We planted over hundreds of trees there, so it's just becoming a really beautiful place as well. And again, there's been a lot of studies that show, you know, gardening and, and working together has been really therapeutic, and for girls coming out of just immense trauma, we see this as a huge benefit. But one of the, the keystone things about this is that when girls are rescued from the sex trade, you know, the rescuing is just the beginning. From there, you know, they only have one uh, mentality of, of how to make money. You know, they were taken away at such a young age that when they then get out of the trade, they end up relapsing, going back into that because that's all they know. And so by providing vocational training, we can enable them to then leave that center and not go back into the industry and live a new redeemed life. 
So that's a little bit of what we do, and I just want to land on two different things I've learned at Biola and things that I want to part with you. First is to pursue your passions and community. This is a picture of our team. A lot of them are Biola alumni, and we get to work a lot together and travel the world together, and it's been super fun. Uh, and this is a biblical thing, right? You know, Jesus did his ministry in community. And when Jesus left, he empowered his disciples to go out in community as well. And this has been just such a, a, a beautiful thing for us because when things don't go right and we have failures and this work is really hard, we have each other to encourage one another. And, you know, sometimes things go a little bit too well and we start feeling like, hey, we got this. We're doing this all on our own. And, again, you have that community to, to center you and remind you, hey, God gets the glory. This is for him. This is for his people. It's not about us. And you have that, that community, again, to, to kind of humble you. And, and this is a shot of some of the guys out here in Cambodia. Sam, who's actually sitting here, uh, was just came back from three months out there doing incredible work at that sex trafficking rehab site. And then us uh, here in Washington at our staff retreat last uh, week, where all five of us in the center, all those guys, are bio alumni, people that we met through you know, SMU trips, through Living in Stewart together. And so... Again, this community here is so beautiful, it's so vital, invest in it, and when you leave here, leave with that community and do radical things with them. And the last thing I wanna focus on, oh, and again, here's us in, in, in Mexico. Everyone here is bio alumni as well. The last thing I wanna say is this. Pursue your passions for the glory of God. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. So basically, seek the Lord. Embrace your passions. Pursue them full force. And he will use you and use those passions that he's given you, that he's designed and created you with for his glory and to bring about his kingdom. And I just want to close by sharing one story of how I've seen this played out in my life and in Harvestcraft. So... I was just down in Haiti in January and checking up on a chicken farm that we had running in this community where we're employing five people. And when I got there, I was with uh, main country director, Daniel, and we showed up on the site and there were six people at the site working. And I was like, hey, Daniel, I thought, you know, the, the project was only sustainable enough to employ five people. He said, no, well, you know, there's this guy in the community, he hasn't had a job for a while, but he just really believes in this, really loves his community and has this heart to serve, wants to serve, and has just been kind of volunteering. I'm like, hey, that's awesome, that's super cool, like, love that we can embrace him even though, like, he's not being paid. And so Daniel does these monthly trainings with the staff every month, and, uh, you know, just to kind of gather the vision to make sure that everyone's doing their job well, make sure that they understand what we're doing and, and why we're doing this, how we want to love these people. And so he said, hey, you know, his name's Aries. He's like, Aries, come, come, to the, come to the training with us, you know, like, you're part of the team now, like, you should come. So Aries is like, yeah, man, of course, I want to be part of this, so I'll come. So Aries comes, and Daniel's just talking about, again, that we just want to love people radically, that we want to work with a church to provide real solutions, that we want to empower this community and, and, and just demonstrate the love that God has for us through this and be able to provide for them. And Aries in the back is just wheels spinning, wheels spinning, and he starts yelling. I said, Daniel, Daniel, I think I finally get it. And Daniel's like, what do you mean you get it? He's like, what do you get? He's like, I get why the church exists. I get what you guys are doing here. I get the love that you have for your God and the love that he has for us. And because of that, I want to know this God. I want to know this God that you serve. And Aries got down on his knees right there at the back of that room and called Daniel to come over and pray for him. And Aries accepted the Lord that day. Yeah, no, it was beautiful. And it's so cool to see stuff come full circle. And so now Aries is a believer and it's like fired up going to church down that community and it's been so fun and the best thing about it is that after about a month that project became so successful was generating so many funds that we were selling out of, out of eggs like a week in advance that then we had enough money to now employ Aries and he can now provide for his two kids as well so in conclusion pursue your passions and community pursue them for the glory of God and I promise you he will use them to bring about his kingdom thank you I love the enthusiasm. How are we doing? We all right? It's good that you are all here in chapel, especially on a Friday. I remember Fridays were those days where uh, a lot of times I'd have to drag myself from Horton or uh, Sigma to come out. And so I appreciate you being here. In the couple of minutes that I have with you, I really want to address two main 
two main areas, two main issues, especially about my path as an alumni. And, and, and number one, uh, I want to first dispel some myths about this alumni path, right? Cindy alluded to a couple of those, but I want to address some. And in the second, I want to impart on you some skill sets, some tools that I picked up along the way that helped uh, help my path and will hopefully help smooth out your path. And so what is this particular myth that I want to dispel? Well, how many of you by a show of hands have heard, if you go to college, you'll get a good job? Okay, so quite a few of you, quite a few of you. Well, that was also imparted to me, right? I, I heard it from my mentors, I heard it from my parents, I, I, I heard it from my friends. Uh, they were saying, Alan, go to, go to college because I promise you know that's going to lead to a good job. Now, I took that and I ran with that as far as, as I could go. I said, all right, I'm going to go to college. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a degree in something that I, I feel is a, is a good skill set and that I was somewhat passionate about. Take that, and then from, from getting a, a good job, I was thinking that maybe I would live comfortably, right? So I, if I go to college, I get a good job, then maybe I'll live comfortably. And by living comfortably, what I assumed was uh, being able to obtain a bunch of things, being able to go on vacations, being able to uh, fulfill some of my, my needs, my desires. Um, and then from that, I went from go believing that going to college will lead to a good job, a good job will lead to more money, more money to li living comfortably. And then from living comfortably, I felt like that's when the path started to get real hazy for me. It was like, all right, I live comfortably, I may, I may, you know, have kids, have a good retirement plan, uh, retire somewhere, um, you know, in the Maldives or, or in Italy, somewhere comfortably, and then die and leave it all to my family. And so you can see how that, le that, that level of thinking from getting, going to college to dying and leaving some things really is an empty pursuit, right? It's really empty. And so it took quite a while for me, about a year and a half, um, I, start, I started my career working in entertainment, uh, working in television marketing, so working for TV shows like The Big Bang Theory, and working for uh, Pretty Little Liars and a, and a lot of the, the shows that you all might, might like. And so I, I began that career, uh, you know, surrounded by great folks, and yet I knew that I was pursuing this because I was thinking that logic. I had that logic. I was like, well, this is a great career path, it's safe, even though tru truly it wasn't my passions. And so it took me quite a while talking with folks, talking with other alumni, uh, family members, mentors, who said, Alan, maybe this isn't the path for you. Have you ever considered something different? And from that, I knew that I had to do some self-introspection, and that came, and that, that, that brought me to a, the conclusion that I was very passionate about public service, about serving people. Uh, I'm from South LA, uh, Inglewood particularly, and I know that um, service and public service has always been a part of my upbringing. Um, just the community that I come from, a lot of times, um, whether it's, it's, it's violence, whether it's drug abuse, uh, prostitution, things of those natures, that, that had already surrounded my life. And so I knew that um, there were issues out there that I wanted to change. There were issues out there that I wanted to impact. And so I ended up uh, going back to graduate school, Pepperdine, getting a master's in public policy, and then that immediately uh, catapulted me into a career in politics. Now, before you start casting the stones in politics, um, I think that, number one, it's a noble profession, and I think especially if you peel back enough layers um, in the field of politics today, you can, you can believe that we need Biolans, we need Azusa Pacific graduates, we need men and women um, committed to, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in the field of politics in the public sector. And so I started that. And, I, and from, from, from going into politics, I worked for mayors, I wrote speeches for, for congressmen, I, I, I lived uh, in Washington, D.C. That literally just shot my career out, right? And I, I was doing all these things that maybe two or three years ago I thought I would never do. And so though my, my career path is a little different, right, many of you may not be interested at pol in politics at all, I think that the moral um, that I'm trying to impart from you is to take a chance, 
right? And that hopefully lay down um, this ideal that your, your career path is lineal, that it's, it's, a, it's a process, it's a step by step by step, when a lot of times it was like, you know, I was playing football and I'm going this way and then I have to cut this way. And, and all the while I'm relying on the Lord and saying, Lord, I believe you really want me to do this. My, my passion is to serve people created in your image, but I don't see what the next path is. And when I just said, Lord, take my life, take with it, do with it what you want to, and that, how scary that was, that's when the Lord really started to open up opportunities for me. And so there's a couple of things I want to leave you all with with the couple of minutes I have left. Number one, ask yourself, what is the common denominator for your life right now, right? What, the things that you do, why are you getting your education, right? Um, if you have internships or if you're even a freshman or sophomore and you haven't really thought about that, what is that common denominator? What, what are you dividing your life by? Is it by Christ? Is it by um, expectations put on you by yourself? Is it that linear thinking that I had early on? You have to ask yourself that, and maybe there's some things in your life that you need to deconstruct and debunk in order for you to really start to fulfill some of the passions that you have right now, right? It doesn't necessarily happen when you cross the stage, you, you, you dap uh, uh, Dr. Corey, and then you get off, you get your diploma, and you take off, but it starts right now. Um, another, another key point is to do away with busyness. I think that our generation is the busiest generation, but the less productive generation, I, I'm, I'm sure, on earth. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a lot of times I used to spend my days putting out fires, doing different things, but realizing that I was no closer to my goals at the beginning of the day than by the end of the day. Also, I told myself that I refused to work a nine to five for somebody else's vision and not for expanding the kingdom. And so I wanted to make sure that my career path was aligned in trying to, trying to expand the kingdom, and also impact the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, another issue, serve however, whenever. However, whenever. Um, a lot of times I try to tell students, uh, I'm, I'm a professor here as well, and a lot of times I try to tell students, um, you can lead only as far as you have gone. But the issue is you've gone somewhere and somebody needs that leadership, right? The path that you have walked, you can impart that on either a freshman or a sophomore, or you can go outside the four walls of the classroom and help folks. So make sure that you try to serve and, uh, and identify areas where you can really use your skill sets, your passions to impact others. And then last but not least, again, you got to ask yourself the question and even pray this, Lord, what have you created me to do? Lord, what, what are my frustrations? What are my passions? What are those areas that I truly feel that I can help and add value to? And so when you, when you ask yourself those series of questions and when you, when, you, when you really start to pray, I think the Lord will start to reveal to you things he, he really wants you to pursue. Now, he may not give you the entire picture, but, but believe that nothing catches the Lord off guard. And so if you take a step, he'll meet you. And he did that in my life. And so in conclusion, again, try to debunk those myths, right? Try to do away with busyness. Try to commit yourself to service. And then last but not least, try to recalibrate your mind and your prayer and your prayer life to ask the Lord, what have you created me to do, Lord, um, for your kingdom and for my fellow man? And again, you know, I had great experiences. I've worked in Washington, D.C. I've worked in Central America and Seaside, Oregon, and everywhere across the, across the country, impacting political um, sectors and the public sectors in, in order to help people created in God's image. And so I'll leave you all with that, and, I'm, I, and I'll be, be on the side here and hoping to speak with some students and other alumni. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Cindy, Brendan, and Alan. Well, you know what? Um, if I think about my life, I think of two of the hardest times in my life, if I could share that with you guys. The number one hardest time of my life was my last semester of my senior year in college. And I sat there, and my second hardest time was my last semester of my, of my grad school. So it's very related. And I remember just thinking, how does this, how does what I study translate to the rest of my life? And I remember being swamped with anxiety and wondering, where am I going to find a job? Where am I going to find friends? Where am I going to find my community? Where am I going to find all these things that I had at school? Maybe you're asking that question. And so we're grateful for the perspective that three young alumni have given us. It's good to hear from brothers and sisters who are a few steps ahead of us, 
From Cindy, I'm reminded that God has perfect timing. From Brendan, it's about taking tangible steps to live out kingdom principles. And from Alan, following God in the twists and turns that he has for us. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.